Hi, everyone. Happy Friday and welcome to our very first Lunart Live session. My name is Eva Ugetschit and I am the founder of Lunart and you're today's host. So I am very excited uh, about today's session because we have a very special guest speaker for you, a sound engineer, Audrey Martinovic. Hi, Audrey, and welcome. Hi, Eva. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And um, I just have to say that it's really my pleasure to have you here. And after hearing just two minutes ago about your crazy schedule for today, <laughs> so you had like two recording sessions. You have already this. Already today, yeah. Already today, you are working with uh, Girls Rock Camp right after? Yes, yeah, yep. Teaching some campers how to make music and play instruments on Zoom. Wow, is that yeah. is like your everyday like this busy and like all over the place? So, sometimes, yeah, it's a little, we have the camp just this week, so um, that's kind of thrown uh, the schedule a little out of whack there, but uh, generally I do try to book my days full, otherwise I get bored. Not, I love that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great, so Audrey, before we dive into this, um, I have a question for you. Actually, I noticed that your last family name has this very specific Eastern European vibe to it. It's more like XU vibe. It's very similar to mine, Martinovic, yeah. Ungercic. So I was just wondering where your family name comes from. So it is Serbian. Uh, my mom is half Serbian and half German. And so it comes from her side of the family. And uh, yeah, I just, I really like holding on to that bit of history. So I didn't change it when I got married. Uh, my husband's last name is Smith, which is not nearly as exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I feel the same with my husband's family name. Sorry, Dave. Oh, uh, Dave's a great, he's great. <laughs> Great. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you end up in this industry and why audio engineering? Absolutely. Um, so I have a background in classical singing and I'm a soprano. And uh, during my lessons, I would record myself. And the point of that is to just get an audience perspective on your performance. And you get a, a different perspective on how your technique might be coming out. Like uh, you might notice that you're not enunciating your words as clearly as you think you are. Um, so it's a popular thing to do. And so when when I started doing that, I noticed this change in how can I make my singing better to how can I make this recording better? And now how can I do other recordings? And it, it kind of started there. Um, so that was in high school and a little bit after. And I found this school called Madison Media Institute, which is uh, where I decided to enroll. And they had a uh, recording and music technology program. And I signed up as a two year program. I knew nothing about uh, recording music or even like recording in general. I, I bought myself a little microphone and plugged it right into the microphone input on my computer and wondered why it didn't work. And now of course <laughs> I know why it didn't work. Um, so that really kind of started the whole just love of where art and science meet for me in the music world. Um, and uh, during school, I was really intrigued and started learning everything and was just kind of there anytime I could be and really devoted any waking moment I could to it. And it was kind of like, you know, just a, a, a fresh love that I wanted to explore. Um, love it, and, love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I went and got my bachelor's in uh, entertainment media business from the same school. Uh, shortly after, I ended up teaching there for a little bit. That school's no wow. longer around, sadly. Um, but then I started working at this studio that I'm sitting in now called Audio for the Arts, uh, first as an intern. And then now I own the place with my business partner, Buzz Kemper, who's recorded for Eva a bunch. So yes. it's, it's Hi, all Buzz. in the family. Yeah, he's not here today. It's his birthday. So his I allowed birthday, him yes. to take the day off. Yeah. <laughs> no, he, he planned it himself. <laughs> <laughs> well, happy birthday, Buzz. We miss you. I'll <laughs> say then, thank you on his behalf. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Oh, so uh, just one more thing. I think recently you posted that you were accepted to like a Grammy Recording Academy. 
That's yes. like your latest yes. achievement. So congrats. Can you tell us just a little bit about that? Thank you. Yeah, that's the National uh, Recording Academy or uh, National Academy for Recording Arts and Sciences. I got to get it right. And uh, so this is... Yes, exactly. Um, this is the organization that is known for awarding Grammys. So for uh, music creators in general, it could be an artist or it could be people on the production side. And earlier this year, I applied to become a voting member and found out uh, July 9th that I was accepted and can now vote in the Grammys and I'm participating in their summer of advocacy. So music creators are getting in touch with their congressional representatives about passing legislation that helps the music industry during COVID because as you know there's no performances or anything going on and so musicians right. especially have really taken a hit so I'm, I'm really really happy to be involved with uh, trying to get some stuff passed with them too. That's amazing congratulations that's really awesome. Okay yeah. so today we're going to talk actually about the women in music technology and their incredible contribution to to this field, right? The art and um, um, the science, as you said, behind audio engineering. So Audrey prepared uh, about 20 minutes long presentation and included five women, but because of the time restriction today, we're gonna talk about three. Uh, and then um, the whole presentation can be found on our website uh, at lunartfestival.org slash live. Um, and also, I just want to say that if you have any question or you just want to say hi and tell us about your impressions of this live stream, just type into the comments below. So with that said, I think we're going to start with Wendy Carlos. So here we go. Awesome. Composer and synthesist Wendy Carlos was born in 1939 in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, where she started piano lessons at the age of six. She also showed skills in graphic arts and the sciences, winning a Westinghouse Science Fair scholarship for a home-built computer. After pursuing a hybrid major in music and physics at Brown University, she earned an MA in music composition at Columbia University, studying the first electronic or studying at the first electronic music center in the US. Upon graduation, Wendy worked as a recording engineer and befriended Robert Moog, the creator of the iconic Moog synthesizer but it was Wendy who popularized the instrument and electronic music as a new genre. In the early 1960s, it was difficult to get people to listen to, never mind take seriously, any music that was made electronically. The general public considered it to be avant-garde in the worst sense, uh, completely without redeeming value or commercial interest. In truth, nearly all of the music made with electronic means at the time had been original contemporary classical music. It was the dissonance, avoidance of melody, harmony, and other such features of modern music of the time that made it an alien, hostile learning experience for the masses. Electronic music with the same properties was certainly no better, but also no worse. But here, the electronic medium was blamed, not the music. So Wendy thought that if she offered people a little bit of traditional music, and they could clearly hear the melody, harmony, rhythm, and all the traditional values, they'd finally see that electronic music was really a pretty cool new medium. In collaboration with Rachel Elkind, who served as her producer for a dozen years, Carlos hit platinum cells with her 1968 recording, Switched on Bach, which became the first platinum selling classical album ever, won three Grammy awards, and propelled the Moog synthesizer into the public consciousness. She refined her techniques in her follow-up album, The Well-Tempered Synthesizer, and introduced her use of vocoders for synthesized singing in her score for Stanley Kubrick's film, A Clockwork Orange, long before Star Wars movies made synthetic voices common. A Clockwork Orange itself came along at a challenging time in Wendy's life. Wendy is a transgendered woman who had been medically transitioning in stealth for three years at the time and living as a woman for two. In 1979, she publicly came out as trans in an interview with Playboy saying, I've got to be careful that I don't attack my background as being wholly destructive. Though the events of her closet of life may have been traumatic, she says, quote, they might have encouraged my work, my escape into the world of thought and music and science and technology. After recording several more albums in a classical vein, Carlos wrote horror music for Kubrick's The Shining and composed the score for the 1982 Disney film Tron. 
The latter score established a continuous blend between symphonic orchestra and digital and analog synthesizers, an often imitated combination. Digital Moonscapes followed in 1984, introducing the LSI Philharmonic Orchestra, a digital replica of orchestral timbres virtually indistinguishable from their acoustic instrumental counterparts. Over 1992 to 1995, in collaboration with synthesist and friend Larry Fast, Wendy developed a state-of-the-art digital process of soundtrack restoration and stereo surround film conversion called Digi Surround Stereo Sound. This novel technique has proven invaluable on recent film and music projects and in the remasterings of older works. Wow, Audrey, that was amazing. I mean, she is absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> she is. So I was I was doing a research because um, I, to be honest, didn't know about her Switched on Bach album. Yeah. And apparently that's the album that made her really famous, right? Absolutely. And, yeah, that was like the breakout album for her, yeah. Right. And that album also helped popularize the very first uh, like commercially available keyboard, like Moog synthesizer. But yeah. while while doing the research, I didn't, I mean, obviously the synthesizers in like 1960s didn't have features that we have nowadays and they were right. monophonic, right? Mm -hmm. So you will be able, mm -hmm. you're able to record only one melody and Bach is, was writing polyphonic Many. music, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I can yeah. only imagine what the, the production behind it, like, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like, I read somewhere that it took them like hundred, oh, sorry, 1,000 hours, about five months to record that. That's yeah. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, basically with a, with a monophonic instrument, you've got the one note that'll make a sound at a time. So when you do these complex layers, each of those is a separate recording that just gets built on top of the previous thing. And what's interesting about choosing to marry classical music with an electronic instrument is that some of the natural like vibrato and nuance of an acoustic instrument doesn't translate as well. So she came up with alternate tunings that would help to make some of those things a little easier to play. And so on her follow-up album, uh, I think it's the Well-Tempered uh, Synthesizer that is on a different tuning than switched on Bach and uh, a different uh, feel to it. Wow. Yeah. Unbelievable. So um, Audrey and actually my producer just told me that uh, right before we went into this presentation, my, I glitched a bit. So I just want to encourage our audience members to that if you have any comments or questions, Bill, please um, write in the chat. And Audrey, we'll make sure actually to answer to all your questions later, right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Okay, so the next one is absolutely phenomenal. I'm very excited uh, for the, our audience to hear about her. So it's Sylvia Matti. Mm -hmm. Dave, are we ready? Few push the boundaries of creativity quite like Sylvia Massey. Probably best known for recording Tool's 1993 album Undertow, as well as her work with System of a Down, Johnny Cash, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Massey's career began in the mid 80s with metal and punk records. In the late 80s, she moved to Los Angeles and worked at the iconic Larrabee Sound as an engineer, producer, or mixer on recordings from artists including Aerosmith, Prince, Julio Iglesias, Seal, and Paula Abdul. It was at Larrabee where Sylvia connected with producer Rick Rubin and would work with him on several projects spanning seven years. I could list more of Sylvia's amazing credits, but I want to get to what makes her so amazing in the first place, her love of experimental sounds and adventure recording. She's known for unexpectedly appearing in the most unusual places, from caves to castles to icebergs to submarines, and recording in those places. In 2016, Massey recorded Seattle-based all-women noise band Thunder Pussy in an abandoned nuclear power plant's cooling tower for the song Torpedo Love. Sylvia recorded singer-songwriter Sarah Brendel in the underground venue at the Merkers Show Mine, a retired salt mine in Merkers, Germany. In the summer of 2008, she gained access to the abandoned London Underground Station at Aldwych to record British band Goddamn on the subway platform. 
Sylvia Massey currently operates her studio called Studio Divine out of Ashland, Oregon, where she can be found piping guitar solos through power drills and recording what comes out the other end. When I attended a 10 day long workshop in France with Sylvia called Mix with the Masters, she led us through recording audio through cheese uh, and pickles. <laughs> She cut a power cable in half, stuck the leads in a two inch block of cheese and patched it into the recording gear, which is a gross oversimplification of the process, but we only have so much time. And voila, the fromage filter. Here's what that sounded like. And FYI, the cheese melted, and yes, we all ate it. Um, Sylvia has been building the world's largest vintage uh, microphone museum within the walls of her studio Divine, featuring microphones dating back to the early 1900s. She's also a celebrated author and visual artist as well. Great. Wow. Um, I have so many questions. <laughs> But first of all, I want to ask you, can you tell us actually a little bit more about your interaction with her and how she work with and just her personality? Yeah, for sure. For sure. It was it was really, really awesome to meet and work with her. So I uh, attended a seminar series called Mix with the Masters that is held in the south of France. And it is a 10 day long thing where you go to this recording studio and it's a very famous recording studio. Um, like Radiohead has been there. Rammstein did an album right there, like right after I was there. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I stayed in the room that Tom York from Radiohead <laughs> sleeps in when he Ooh. records there. It was cool. Um, and it's this, yeah, it's this, you know, turn of the century French farmhouse and uh we worked with a uh, a band from England and she it was it was just really really fascinating she has this very deep love of um pulling something apart and seeing if there's a way to make sounds with it so we took apart power drills we took uh as the video said we put audio through cheese and pickles and we're like go to the kitchen what else we can find um at one point the uh power went out to the whole uh building uh mm -hmm. for several hours and we ended up uh, getting a laptop and trying to like make make it work somehow by like wiring nine volt batteries together like we're like should we do this in parallel or in series how do we you know and we were trying to do a recording on a laptop with no power except for batteries and we thought about hooking it up to a car battery but it didn't go quite that far <laughs> Oh, I love it. So I'm pretty sure that every single person in the audience wants to know what type, I'm a big uh, French cheese lover and nerd. So like, what type of cheese did you use for this project? <laughs> oh, I know. And that's like the one detail I, sh I like wish I remember. I don't remember specifically what kind it was, but it was so good. It was like a, a, a hard cheese works better. Um, mm -hmm. because there is electricity that passes through it and a soft cheese will melt too quickly. So I do know I, it was a, a, a firmer cheese with like a harder outside for any like there's cheese so, aficionados. There, <laughs> there's so many that fit that, that description, but uh, can you, I mean, it, you just touched a little bit. Can you just tell us just a little bit more how actually that works? Like what's the I don't know, physics, I guess, kind of? like how, like using a cheese would help you like produce like a filter. Like yeah, then, yeah. So it's, so basically you could think of a filter um, or, a, or an effect or some way of processing. It's kind of, we're, we're using that terminology interchangeably. It is a mm -hmm. little different when you get into the specifics of it, but basically what we did is we had a guitar player and uh, took the output of his amp and uh, plugged it into a power amp because you need a lot of voltage <laughs> and uh, had two of the cables going like one into and one out of the cheese for one half of our two cable connection. And then the other one was all together. And you plug that in uh, to just your console or a direct input and 
turn it up and listen to it. And you have not very long before the cheese melts. So um, it, what was really interesting was that she said that depending on the type of food, cause she has done this with all sorts of different food, you get different reactions. Like pickles will glow because of the sodium content. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, things will cook, things will, will glow, things will not do anything if it's really like a dense kind of thing, like potatoes are not super exciting, I guess. We didn't try any right. potatoes, but yeah, that's that's a little bit of that process. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love it. Did you, did you ever use that in your studio afterwards? Did you know, we did, <laughs> I, I haven't, but we did, uh, we had a, a, a group here called Tiny Dinosaur that was recording. And so we were like, oh, we should get a dinosaur shaped block of cheese and put it on their stuff. It, it changes the sound so that it sounds like almost a distortion pedal. If anyone has any of that kind of gear, it just adds this like crunchiness to it. <laughs> Love it. That's amazing. Well, thank you. Um, I believe we have time for one more. Um, and it's we're going to talk about Linda Perry. Yes. Linda Perry, born April 15th, 1965, is a singer, songwriter, musician, and record producer. She was the lead singer and primary songwriter of Four Non Blondes, and her work as a producer and songwriter showcases a range of talents that have come to define the sound of contemporary music. She has founded two record labels and composed and produced hit songs for several artists, including Beautiful by Christina Aguilera, What Are You Waiting For by Gwen Stefani, and Get the Party Started by Pink. Perry has also contributed to albums by Adele, Alicia Keys, and Courtney Love. Perry was also inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 2015. Her story begins at age 21 when she moved uh, from San Diego to San Francisco, where the goal was to pursue music, though not before waiting tables and working at a pizzeria. After some time spent performing solo at Bay Area clubs and coffee houses, Perry composed her first professional song called Down On Your Face and was recruited into the band Four Non Blondes by its founder, Krista Hillhouse, in the middle of 1989. After several years of playing locally and negotiating with various record companies, the band finally signed with Interscope Records and released its debut album, Bigger, Better, Faster, More, on October 9, 1992. The album featuring Perry as lead singer was dominated by her compositions, and was an immediate success and spawned the hit single, What's Up? Um, Also erroneously called What's Going On. But she wasn't really a fan of the direction her music was taking as part of Four Non Blondes. It was too, quote, fluffy and polished. So she began focusing on solo material and writing for other artists. In 2000, Perry was contacted by pop rock singer Pink, seeking production and songwriting assistance on her second album. Perry co-wrote and produced much of Pink's successful album, Misunderstood, which brought Perry back into the spotlight as a music producer. Since then, she's gone on to work with many artists, including Jewel, Alicia Keys, Celine Dion, Melissa Etheridge, Solange Knowles, uh, Kelly Osbourne, James Blunt, and Cheap Trick. Last year, Linda Perry became the seventh woman to ever be nominated in the producer category of the Grammys, but Pharrell Williams ended up clinching the award. No woman has ever won that category yet. Wow. So Audrey, um, I want to personally thank you for this because you just like threw me back into my high school years (laughs) when I was absolutely a fan of like Linda Perry and her band uh, with my super cool high school girlfriends. So thank you so much about that. (laughs) <laughs> Yay. Yeah, I love her. I really wanted to like pick people that I would be pretty certain that everyone watching had heard their work, but didn't know them. So I'm glad that you were familiar with her. Oh my God. Yes. I love her voice and mm-hmm. I mean, her style. Like, yeah. Outfits, it's just yeah. Like, <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly. She's always got this cool hat on now too. That's like part of the style. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I, I love it. So thank you so much. Yeah, um, so again, for everyone out there, if you want to hear a longer presentation that includes two more women that we didn't have a chance to talk about today, and those are Lastly and Jones in Ethel Gabriel, 
please visit our website at lunarpass.org slash live. Um, and yeah, if you have, so Audrey, if audiences have, if we don't get to answer to some of the questions today, and if they have more questions or learn, want to learn more about you, how they can reach out to you, where they can find you. Yeah, you can, uh, my website for the studio is audioforthearts.com and there's contact information up there. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram too. It's at audio Audrey. Awesome, great. So I have actually a first question for you. Yeah. Um, when we were talking, when we were preparing this presentation and we were talking actually about that, you said that only three to 5% of the women are actually in this field, right? Mm -hmm. It's very low percentage so it is yeah so what are some of the factors that may explain this low percentage of so, women in this industry yeah I mean I think that there is um this factor of in this industry in particular you kind of have to do a little bit of choosing like do you want a personal life or do you want to work 14 hours a day because it's super awesome <laughs> um and so sometimes like like me I'm, I'm I consider myself very lucky my husband is very supportive of what I do doesn't mind the long hours the weird schedule all that kind of stuff but it does make it hard for like childcare and like making a family or whatever you, you might want to do in your personal life. Um, so I think that that does kind of create a little bit of a barrier, especially for the live sound uh, people, or women in the live sound industry is that, you know, touring is a whole other thing I don't ever have to deal with. So um, there's, there's that, but then there, there is also this kind of um, aspect of the boys club a little bit. There's a lot of uh, business and, you uh, getting of gigs that is done uh, out grabbing a, a beer with the boys, as they say. And so sometimes uh, we're invited to that and sometimes we're not. So it is a uh, sometimes a lack of just access to opportunity. And um, also maybe people just not thinking to look at the woman in the room as talented in this area. Um, I sometimes say it's sort of like if you walk into a, a hospital room and you see a man and a woman, people might assume that the man is the doctor and the woman is the nurse. It's, yeah. it's the same kind of thing if people walk into the studio here with me and then buzz. Part of that might be age because as Buzz is a little bit older than I am, but um, they'll usually assume that he's the engineer and I'm the intern or secretary or whatever until I start plugging in mics. And usually uh, as soon as they hear how great it sounds, it's they're all, you know, they're happy as heck with their engineer then. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And you, you said also previously that it has also this like science component to it. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Technology, yeah, the, the technology can definitely be a barrier just because as kids, uh, girls aren't really introduced to science and math as early, or at least when I was a kid, it, it is changing so rapidly. Like women who have been doing this for 20 or 30 years didn't have any female mentors to really look up to. And now I'm kind of in this middle generation where I have a whole like group of, of these amazing women, some that we just talked about um, right. that I can look up to and align my career with a little bit and see the possibilities of where it is to go. And um, that that is another thing is just seeing women do this is a very new thing like uh the very first uh female uh a and r rep for a label ethel gabriel who's in the full length uh video she was the first woman in that position she's still alive you know <laughs> these yeah. women are still alive and working <laughs> wow yeah 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 absolutely well yes um so we have uh, a very actually interesting questions here so where should young girls go for resources to learn more about this field if they're interested in, interested in you know? Yeah, in it, it depends on the age. So if you're really young, like middle school, if you've got kids who want to learn more about it, there's uh, girls rock camps that are happening. Usually it just teaches you an instrument, but there's uh, tech classes involved with that too sometimes. So that's kind of starting off the younger kids. Uh, for people who are a little bit older, um, there's soundgirls.org. That's an organization that uh, has just created this network of women who do this, but has also in partnership with Spotify created 
provide a database where people who are looking to hire can go and find women to put in, in actual jobs. So there's that value to it. But they also have this mentorship program uh, that I'm a part of. I, I mentor uh, people from around the world. I just uh, finished up a session with uh, Diana in Berlin. So uh, it, nice. it links up experienced engineers with less experienced engineers and facilitates a relationship that way and then helps them to find employment after. It's, it's really great. So what would be your words of encouragement for, for, some, so for newbies in this field? Yeah, I, I would say just create at every opportunity you can. That is the way to sharpen your skills. That's the way to um, get, I mean, just to think of, of new things that you've never even tried before. Uh, YouTube, everything that you can, um, all, you know, ask people for, for questions. There's a, uh, in audio, there's a, a little bit of a culture of being proud or uh, maybe ultra competitive with other engineers, but um, really there's, there's, you know, there's no need to not reach out to people who might know more than you, like learn from their mistakes. You don't always have to make your own to learn. You can ask other people about their mistakes. Absolutely. Yeah. Why don't you take a shortcut and take someone else's experiences and then build on top of that? Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Ex experience is like you can learn all this stuff in a in a book or whatever, but until you actually apply it, it, it you know it it means something very different. <laughs> oh, absolutely, like theory and practical side of it. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, so we have a question from Augusta. It's what's your dream recording location? Oh, I love this. Um, let's see. So I I really like recording in places that intrigue me for one way or the other. Um, I was walking through the Epic campus in Madison here, or maybe it's technically Verona. And I came between two buildings and it just had this weird echo between the two of them. Um, so it's not the most exotic location, but I would love to record there. I don't know if they'd let me just set up and record outside between their buildings where all this proprietary software is <laughs> developed. But <laughs> I think that would be a cool spot. Um, maybe like in a submarine or some like weird oh. environment that I've never been in and so I don't really know how the sound would interact um a well that might be kind of cool although I've recorded in a silo so maybe the circular thing is it would sound kind of the same <laughs> oh I love it submarine yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> a yellow submarine so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um I have one more question it's I was wondering what are some of the like biggest misconceptions when it comes to like a you know, about when it comes to like audio engineering and producing and studio work, your oh, work. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would think that uh, there's a, a lot of people tend to hear that I'm a recording engineer and think that I work like exclusively with rock bands or hip hop and that there's a lot of late nights and I mean, that part's true, um, that, that there's a lot of uh, maybe like nefarious behavior, like, you know, the whole sex, drugs, rock and roll type uh, mm -hmm. image. But I mostly work with acoustic musicians. That's my specialty. Mm -hmm. So I, I work with jazz and classical and singer songwriter. Um, I love doing like vocal production and stuff. So I think that a big misconception is that like there's uh, the whole like kind of party element. Um, and that, of course, in movies, you see like a big console and the fancy artist walks in and throws down their jacket and just walks into the booth and makes magic happen. And uh, there's a lot of editing that goes into that kind of stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a lot of pitch correction sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to like thank you in, in the name of like all of us uh, acoustic musicians and <laughs> instrumentalists in Madison and area for all you and Buzz have been doing for us. It was oh, just like it's amazing to have you around like it's so our pleasure like we yeah we we just really I I, I mean we I'll speak for Buzz even though he's not here we adore <laughs> the whole music community in Madison and there is some incredible talent here and that obviously includes you and <laughs> Leslie who's not on camera with us but right. is here in the background and it, it it's just it, it's I feel privileged to be working with this community 
Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you for this um, lovely, lovely session and presentation. Uh, I learned a lot, I know, and I'm sure people that watched learned a lot. Um, as I said at the beginning, this was our very first session, but we are planning on continuing with this, um, with this initiative. So we will be meeting uh, every last Friday of the month. So our next guest will be an ethnomusicologist, Nadia Chana, uh, and we are scheduled for Friday, August 28th at noon. So mark your calendar. This is going to be another super fun uh, conversation. Uh, again, reach out to us, reach out to Audrey if you have any questions and like us on Facebook, go to our website, Audio for the Arts website. If you need a phenomenal recording engineer and a studio, please reach out to them. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, well, have a lovely weekend and I will see you soon. Thanks so much, yeah. Eva. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs>